Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. This is all about Imagine Wealth Without Risk, and we're going to talk about working less and making more money. And I usually talk about tax lien certificates and tax defaulted properties. But remember, the podcast is also about creating wealth. And I really have an expert with me today, and I'm so glad to have him. If I can just say his name, you guys are going to be proud of me. So <laughs> listen, and his, his first name is Adam. So you know we can all do that because we all learned about Adam and Eve. But listen to this last name. This is a handle you'll never forget, okay? His last name is Hergenrother. Hergenrother. Now, can you say that? That's terrific. All right, so we're going to have Adam with us today. Now, this guy is really special. Now, here's why. He's a special guy because he doesn't like to run one business like the rest of us. He's running five businesses in three different states. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a full-time job just handling one of these businesses in one state. And this guy's going to do all of that. Adam, welcome to the call. Can you hear me okay? I can, Ted. Thanks so much. It, it took me to about high school to figure out how to say my last name. So you're way ahead of the game here. Oh, I'm ahead. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I feel so. This is going to be a great podcast because I get the names. I did very well. Exactly. So, Adam, it really is a, a pleasure to have you. You and I have talked before, so I know a lot. But give us a little bit about yourself and tell us about your journey to get where you are today and tell us about some of the things that you're doing. My audience is going to love this. They're interested in wealth building. Now, of course, I have a very narrow focus with my tax lien certificate and tax deed. But you have a really broad, not only base, but a broad knowledge of a lot of different businesses. So tell us about yourself. Sure. First, thanks for all that you do and the time and energy that goes into these podcasts and for your listeners who are getting value out of it. So I just want to thank you for all that you're doing here. It takes a lot of energy. Thank you. I'll take you on a small journey here because I think it's important. I just want to dumb myself down for the, for the listeners because I want them to think that if I can do this, they certainly can too. And so up until I was about 16 years old, so from basically my entire childhood, I was about 100 pounds overweight, really pinnacle at the towards the end of my 15th, 16th year of life. And I was in the drugs. I was failing classes. Ted, I was that role model student you wanted your kid to hang out with yeah, I <laughs> at, at the time. And I, I came home one day and uh, I started crying. And I just, I literally cried most of the night. I didn't know why I was crying. I didn't know what life was supposed to be about. I didn't know why I was on this journey. I, I can say it a lot clearer now, now that I'm 37, um, looking back on those times, but I was very insecure. I was living somebody else's life. I was living in mediocrity. I was always trying to please other people. I was trying to just be somebody else because I wasn't happy with who I was, particularly in the outer side. And so I, one day I just had this moment and I, a lot of people on, on, on podcasts and shows and have asked me about what was that moment like? And you know, I, I wish it, was, it wasn't like this, just all of a sudden, like this guiding light came down and did anything. It was just more of just, just, just feeling inside that just was so overwhelming that I said, I, I have to make some, I have to make a change. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew I had to make a change. So I, I stayed up all night long, visualizing kind of what I wanted my life to look like. I didn't know what it was going to be or how it was going to look like, but I knew I needed to do something different. So the next day I stopped hanging out with all the kids that I was hanging out with. And it was about two weeks. They stole everything I had, huge ordeal at my school. So there I am trying to figure out my whole life. I ended up getting on a, a very strict weight loss thing. I, I lost a hundred pounds in a year. I got into sports, ended up finding my way to a new group of individuals who it's funny. I actually employ a lot of them now, which is hilarious. I went to a new group of places and, and then I, and then I worked through it and school never was easy for me. I'm not great at taking tests administratively that way. And so I, but I was up for the challenge and did it. And I, I went through high school and then I got into college and I bring that point up because about 10 years later, when I was 26 years old, I, I resided in Vermont, which is economically very small compared to a lot of places, which is also why I've expanded outside of Vermont. But I, I remember a moment about 10 years later, I was 26. I, I had this goal in my mind that probably a lot of your listeners have had this happen to them before where I, I had this, if I could make $500,000 in income, I was going to be somebody, right? Like I just had this vision. I was young. I didn't know anything. And I just knew that I was like, I had this number. And when I was when, at the end of my 26 years, I, I made about a little over half a million dollars that year. And, wow. I, and I came in and I remember having this conversation with my mom, Ted, and I said, Hey mom, do you understand that I did this really cool thing? And I was actually pretty hubris at the time. I, I thought, I was like, look what I did. And, my, and I remember my mom's response. She was like, well, that's great, honey. And just moved on. And it was one of those aha moments that you have in your life where you realize people just don't give a shit. 
<laughs> what are you doing? They just don't. And even my mom didn't. So I actually, what happened to is I got depressed because I thought like some of you probably listening, I thought that if I just made more money, I was going to be happier. Or that once I got this thing that I was somehow. Oh, like, everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks they that. They do, right? They do. They yeah. think. Get a bigger I love, car. A bigger car always does. Exactly. It was all those things. A bigger what, house. What I realized was actually every time I got one of those material or external things, yeah. I realized that it actually made me less happy and I got more depressed. So every time I made it, I've made it less. So it actually was a reversing effect. So then I stopped and paused. And this will circle back to business in a second. And then I realized I needed to go on an inward journey. I needed to search the truth and the truth will set you free, but the truth may be very painful. So I went on this whole kind of inner journey for a while and I've been on and I'm still on it now. And I'm, I'm much more spiritual than I ever was. And spirituality, don't get lost in that word. It's not like you're sitting on top of a cliff in a kneeling down position with a fire and smoke coming up, reciting haikus. It just means that there's something more than you that's out there. And so the funny thing though, is the minute I stopped making life about me and I made it about other people over those next 10 years, basically 26 to 36 is when my business has exploded. And I, in a good way, really meaning that we went from probably when I was 26, we maybe had 15 people in my organization, maybe 10 and I've got 450 now. And so we really just exploded in our world there. And by focusing on serving, I hate that word serving because it's such as you so all the time, but just really focus on other people besides yourself. And again, it doesn't mean you don't increase your own wealth and have fun. I'm not saying you don't buy things, you don't want it, but don't buy things with the expectations they're going to change who you are inside. Money is only going to exaggerate you. If you're an asshole, you're going to be a rich asshole. If you're a giver, you're going to be a rich giver. And so part of it is I wanted to determine who I wanted to become. So I went on that path and that's how I've set up my organizations in a way of how do we give to our organ one of my companies, we give 48% of the profit away, which is really cool. Last month we gave, I think it was like $988,000 we had given away so far, and uh, which was awesome. And, and it's real money for real people and it makes a big difference to these things. And, and so we, just, we set up that tone and so that's a little intro into to what we do. And we're in the vertical of real estate. I own we can always get into real estate. I, I, you made such a tra transformation here. G give, give me a little insight into, and uh, while you were talking, I was saying, boy, this is a spiritual experience. I could feel it taking place, but maybe because I've lived some little pieces of that, but yeah. the yeah. spiritual change it is hard for people to comprehend. So I don't want to, I don't want to go into that because we're into kind of being capitalists, but let's let, talk a little bit about this transformation because everybody on my call, I don't care who they are, they are male or female. How did you make the decision to lose a hundred pounds? Just give me that because that is the same thing that took place 10 years later, yeah. somehow that you decided you are now going to give your life to helping other people or you said serving, but you're really yeah. helping other people. I get yeah. that. Nothing wrong with being a capitalist, but, you're helping other people on the way. So there's, exactly. there's a couple of trans, transformations that took place. I think they had similarities, did they? Of course. And that's why I bring up the story is because the people say, well, you're really successful for how young you are. And I, I said, not really. I said, I just started working and investing in myself when I was 16 years old with intention. And that was really, so I just have about 10 years on most people because most people don't start until they get out of college or even in their thirties. So I just started a little bit earlier than everybody else did. It's not that I'm different. Yeah, it was this moment that I just, I wanted to, I, here was the thing is I never wanted anybody to put a limit on my thinking. I never wanted anybody to tell me who I, what I couldn't be. And so I just started visualizing and my part of my visualization was I need to change myself physically. I want to be somebody different physically. And so I just made it. And I just, once I, look, when people make a decision, when they finally make a decision, it may take years to get to it, but when you make the decision, you've made it. Like I, at the time I, I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for probably four or five years. I know in middle school was terrible, but okay. I did. And one day when I was, after I started this transformation, I just woke up one day and I said, I'm done. I just stopped. Throw your clothes away. You yeah, just stop. Yeah. yeah. Just and uh, it's the same, it's the same process. It's just when somebody gets a divorce or changes a career or starts to buy tax liens because they're sick of living yeah. the yeah. life that they are, where they start getting into something because they've had enough pain. They want to move away from that and then start their growth. And then they realize that there's this whole other avenue of life that they can, you can be a capitalist, you can be a cautious capitalist, right? You can take a yeah. bunch of money. Money is great. I, don't get me wrong, I love every component of it, what it does. I've been able to retire my mom. I've been able to provide vacations for families and give a lot of money. It's amazing what you can do, but what part of you is doing it? 
And that's the part that I want to, I always like to hit on. Oh my gosh. That's a, that's not only one. Thanks for sharing that with us. I appreciate you doing that. So how do you work your uh, everyday life? Are you, are you a person that goes out and runs every morning or do you work out or do you meditate or what do you do? Yeah. So I, a few years ago, maybe six, seven years ago now, I really started trying to get a hold of my life. I think most people live their life, probably not listening here, but they can probably relate to somebody that has, lives in, in, lives in their life in boxes. Meaning like the first box they live in is this learn box where from age one to 20, you're just learning. And then once you get done learning, most people stop learning. As most people never read another book their entire life, right, finish right. a book. So most people live in this learning box. And then after they're learning, they go into this work box. And you've heard these people that have got, I hate my job, Ted, but I've got five years left and I'm just going to get a thousand dollars a month. It's going to be retirement. They just got the job. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they spend all their time in this work box and that's all it is. Their entire life revolves around this work box. And they say, when I hit 65, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to play. I'm going to finally go into the last box and play. Playing when you're 40 or 50 is different than you're playing when you're 65. If well, you get sure. there, right? That's for sure. So I, when I recognize this, how most people live in mediocrity, I just said, you know what? I don't know if anybody's realized, but we're all going to die. <laughs> you have a 0% chance of not. So I just woke up and I said, I'm going to structure my day. So I'm going to allocate a certain amount of time to learning, playing, and working. And whatever I can accomplish within those parameters and guidelines that I've set for my life, I'm going to be okay with. For instance, now, which this would have been a work in progress, so people don't need to go out there and do this tomorrow. But I spend about three or four hours of personal development a day. I also exercise from anywhere between two to six hours a day, just the longer half being on just two days because I, I compete in Ironmans. And then I have boxes for my work life. I work from 8.30 to 11.30. It's one sprint. From 11.30 to 1.30 is my time. I still am working, but it's, there's nothing allowed to go in my calendar during that time. I also meditate twice a day, first in the morning, and then again at between 11.30 and 1.30, I meditate again. And I, I, after that, I work another burst from 1.30 to about 4. And then I clean things up from 4 to about 4.15 or 4.30. And then I leave and I'm done. And part of my thinking is this, is that I have, if we're not accomplishing the things that we need to accomplish with the amount of people that I have in my world, either I'm not setting the right vision, I'm not providing enough clarity, I'm not removing enough roadblocks, or I have the wrong people. And so when I stop, when I start looking at that, whenever things aren't going to accomplish, I always go back to one of those four things. But I've just set up my life of saying, I'm willing to give this amount of hours in each one of these boxes every day. So when my time does come up, I know I've lived fully. All right, now hold on, because what you just said to me, I, I want to just interrupt and see if I got it. And so what I got is, you think out every day, you don't just drift into it and hope things are gonna happen. You've got a, you've got a definite plan, and if the plan isn't working, you don't blame it on anybody else. You just say, I haven't thought this out enough. I should have told someone else to do that. Or you're, you're, you're a planner, an organizer, a detail person. Am I hitting on that pretty close? Yeah, absolutely. I just wake up every morning. Part of my journaling exercise is to set intention for what I need to do to max it. Look, remember, time is not the cheat. People like to think that it is. We all have 24 hours in a day, Ted. That's what we have. So time can't be the cheat. What becomes the cheat is your ability to say no to 99% of the things that show up and say yes to the one or two things that are going to have the biggest impact on your life. So my entire life, I've built this philosophy of I want to accomplish more by doing less. And so in order to do that, you have to say no to a bunch of things and say yes to the one or two things that are going to make the biggest difference in your entire organization. Oh, wow. I love it when you talk about uh, exercising. I'm about 50 years older than you are, <laughs> real close to that. You're, and, you're a young 30 year old. Uh, and I still, I, I, I want you to talk about the Iron Man thing in a minute, but I, I'll have to tell people I, I work out every day. And I, now I'm not doing two hours a day, but I, I make sure that I do that every day. And when I do my bicycle, I hate the wind. Yeah, you're, you're, I'm sure you can tell me about the wind because I, every time I watch an Iron Man, it's always the one in Hawaii where they go from Kona up to the north end of the island. And I just say to myself, who could ever stand that wind? I used to be a pilot and fly in Hawaii. Yeah. And, and, the, and the trade winds, the northeast wind blows. It just blows forever. It just You just some days wish it would stop. And here you have to pedal your bike against it. How about pedaling against the wind? Because if you, did an, if you do Iron Man, I know it's never downhill, right? It never is, and neither is business, right? Sometimes you're going downhill with the wind and you created a tailwind, and other times you need to prepare yourself for an uphill battle with a 30-mile-an-hour headwind, and it's going to be a grind. 
yeah. what's really fascinating about Ironmans is that the there's two things that I, that was since I've started my journey. By the way, I also work four structured days a week, so that's Monday through Thursday. Fridays I don't work. Fridays oh. is my I have three kids, seven, five, and two, so I spend Fridays with my kids. I also build that into my one of my long workout days, so I, I build into about mid morning, so I don't have to worry about it. Doesn't mean I'm not working on myself or reading or different things. People don't take that literally. Um, I'm constantly working on my emotional fitness and my own personal growth, but I don't actually work in the office on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So then I, uh, but on Ironmans, what's really fascinating when you started putting this into play is that the, there's actually a high divorce rate in Ironmans. And the reason why it is people would instantly go the amount of time, and that would make sense, but it's actually right. not. What it is, is, Ted, is that people, most people spend 18 months, 36 months, two or three years, year and a half to two years training for an Ironman. Least, what happens when you set your mind to go train for an Ironman, you change, right? Physically, mentally, Absolutely. emotional, fitness wise. And so what happens is the people that change all this, if their partners don't change with them, then at the end of this, their partner goes, oh man, Ted, I'm so glad you did this. Congratulations. It's amazing. Now I want you to go back to who you were. And it's impossible for them to do that. I also think the same thing happens in business. As we expand, we set our intentions to grow our business. There's some people that change with us and there's some people that can't. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just means that you've grown and either people grow with you or they don't, but you cannot, in either case, you can't be pulling people along. You need to be with them and they need to be running with you. Absolutely. I know you have a lot of experience in real estate and we were going to talk about that, but before we do, yeah. you were either a franchisee or owner mm -hmm. of a, a regular yeah. real estate business. So the, the question I'm going to ask you is not about the real estate. It's about how the heck do you handle all the rejection? I don't know anybody that gets more rejection than real estate people. Yeah. So I do run a, I run the largest real estate office in the state of Vermont. And so we have a, we have a lot of agents. When I first got into it, you just got to, just like anything, business building is mastering the boredom of success. But in the beginning, it was really mastering rejection. And so instead of going in there of, of wincing every time you get rejected, what you need to do is you need to go into it and say, okay, I need to get 30 rejections for every yes. So every time you get a rejection, you just make a mental note that, hey, you're one step closer to getting towards your goal. Really? And the people that take it personally versus the people that can look at it objectively that you're there to help people and you just need to find the people that want to be helped at this moment then you get through it. Other people that, that can't make peace with that just don't do it. I see, I see. It would be so, so difficult to, to work with a, a couple or a, a family or whatever, and then they weeks and weeks of work, and then suddenly they know that isn't it. And they go and work with somebody else. To me, I've always thought that's got to be a painful business to even start in, let alone do on a regular basis. Now, keep in mind, I'm in real estate in the sense that I have to sell it, and I know that every person doesn't buy it. And I know that this, like you said, 30 phone calls before mm -hmm. you, but it's not the, I don't get in the car and drive with these people and do it. You get to know people, you get to like people, at least I do. And uh, I hate to lose them. I always think uh, the relationship is always more important than the business part or anything else. And then to have to lose the people. So I always thought to myself, anybody can handle that business could handle anything because there's so much rejection that uh, uh, really, uh, really uh, a handful of people can handle it, but not very many. So you have a large real estate company. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have a couple different components to it. We have a brokerage that we own, which is the largest in real estate we in the state of Vermont. I also own a company called Hergen Roth Realty Group, which we actually are operating in 16 states now. And it's expensive. It's, it's all on the brokerage side of things. We've created locations in each one of these states and we, just, we build up through our models and systems. So when I started in real estate, last year we were number four in the entire country for most uh, real estate sold out of any company in North America, actually, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's a testament to my team, not to me. We just have amazing people. We approached business, and this is where real estate brokerage is going. I also do own BlackRock Construction, which has been on Inc's. We were number 42 in the Inc. 5000 list. We built healthcare campuses, homes. We've got about 840 or 45 units currently. And so we do a lot of building, construction, home ownership, um, apartment rentals, multifamily, and then we build healthcare campuses too, which I'll talk about that in a second. When I bring back to the, the brokerage side of things, we, we looked at it as like basically like a college basketball team, if you will, whereas what makes college basketball teams such a, such a successful organization is their models, systems, teams, and their leadership. 
And so we approach it the same way, whereas real estate is such a transitory environment. People have their license and they don't. And they are in and out of the, this industry left and right, right? Just some people make it, some people don't. So we looked at it as, as we wanted to control the, and provide a better experience. So when you walk into Starbucks in Vermont or you walk into it in Florida, you walk into it for the same experience. So we just approached it that way. So we built an administrative hub operationally, right? That right. the client has the same experience when they get a listing, when they go to closing, after closing, pre-marketing, post-marketing. So the experience stays the same regardless of who's the one taking the basket or who's the one actually helping them out. And that's what's allowed us to expand our footprint to where it is today because of that. We just approach it differently that way. And that's where you'll, in the next couple of years, as real estate brokerage side really it gets disrupted in a good way. You're going to see the number of agents drop and you're going to see massive teams controlling, massive organizations controlling the majority of the business because of what we can do that way, which is already happening, which is cool. So then that's the broker side and the BlackRock side. I also own a training company, Adam Brother Training, in which we coach real estate agents. We coach people in personal development. We, of course, it's called Project U, just a bunch of different things we're going on. I also own a foundation as well, too, that helps kids with sports and fitness, uh, which is near and dear to my heart as well, too. So do you have a big leadership team? How many people on your leadership team? Each company. So I'm really not good at running companies. I actually suck at it. I'm really actually not even that good at many things at all. And so I enjoy... That didn't, that didn't sound right. <laughs> well, well, maybe good at one thing. But right. I, I am really good at creating. I'm not really good at running. And so what I've done is in every organization that I have, I fired myself. I never really want a job, any one of my companies, an actual job. So I, I fired myself and hired very good leaders in each one of my organizations. And so we, there's leadership teams in, in all five of my companies. And so that they get together and they run and I just meet with them and the leadership team to make sure we're setting direction to what we're doing and providing vision and removing roadblocks and just in constantly growing our organization so they have more opportunities inside their world. So we're leveraged very well with some amazing people who are building out the organization. But tell me a little bit more about how you show people how to grow their leadership capital. How, how do you do that? I think first it just starts, you know, to grow your leadership capital, you have to have a personal development plan for yourself. And so what does that look like? And for most people, I know some people can work in the evenings, but for most people, they've got to figure out a way to gain 30 to an hour every morning or 30 minutes at least. Look, and if you can't find 30 minutes in the morning, then you've got something wrong with your life. It may mean that you have to say no to something in the evening, but you can find 30 minutes to yourself in the morning. And so we start with that, which is what's your form of meditation? Now, what kind of journaling are you doing? What books are you reading? So we have book clubs that are forcing people to read certain different types of books. And we engage in it. Just our ethos of our company is personal growth through business success, meaning you wouldn't sign up for a lawsuit or you wouldn't sign up for five employees leaving or you wouldn't sign up for the an economic policy to come out to affect your business. But all of these things show up. And so we treat this business as a sport, which is my sport of how do I grow personally by serving? And that's why we always look at it as personal growth through business success. So we're constantly pushing people. I've got a good portion of our, in our workforce into meditation. I've got people really? doing Ironmans. I've got them doing marathons. I've, I, we provide and pay for memberships for individuals to go to gyms. And then we get them into, again, the, the reading component, different things. So it starts with just one thing that they were passionate about, and we keep pressing them to move forward personally. Gee, that's really good. You've got a, you're dedicated to making sure your team's uh, the best. That's terrific. I don't think very many uh, business guys even think like that. Yeah, and we have the herglife.com. If you go to adamhergenrother.com, and it links to all of our companies. And we also I have a blog that I write every single week which we've got 139 different countries that are subscribed to that now, which if you, if your listeners are interested in or like what I had to say that every week I take a piece of there and I write it out there, that'd be the best way to follow me. Okay. Spell Hergen rather. <laughs> I know. H E R G E N R O T H E R. So it's Adam Hergen Rother.com. Okay, you got to make sure you get that in there because uh, uh, they, they'll have to stop the car for that one or they'll have to re-listen, that's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> but we're trying to help you guys, okay? This is the this is the front lines of capitalism. There's no doubt about it, okay? <laughs> we're sure there. I asked your girl that and she said, oh, I don't know. Anyway, that's <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to go back to this this brokerage thing because uh, you're into massive amounts of real estate, and when you're in that business, you have a, a feel for the market. So give me a little bit of your feel for the market and what is going on in your. Now you're really in three states, right? New Hampshire. No, we're, we're in 16 states. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. I don't know why I thought three, but what's your sense for the market? Yeah. Just give yeah. us a, a little insight because you're an insider and yeah. you'd like to have that information. Yeah. My job is to study the market trends and where it's going. So here's, here's what's happening right now from a couple of different angles. Number one is what most people are probably seeing is that there is a demand issue, right? So we have more demand than supply is allowing for us basically nationwide right now. There's more people that want to buy homes and they're available. And the homes that are available, they're in a higher price point than most people have. So this is coming down from a couple of different reasons. One is baby boomers themselves are rate locked to their home. What I mean by this is that with interest rates as low as they've been over the last five to seven years, most baby boomers have such low rates on their houses that if they went and sold, it would cost them more to rent a place than it would be to live in their house. So a lot, you're seeing a lot of baby boomers staying in their home. And I'll give you some numbers for this. Right. The average individual stayed in their house for about five and a half years a decade ago. Fast forward to May of this year, the average person staying in their home 11.3 years, more wow. than doubled. This is so when people are staying in their house twice as many, it just means there's less inventory to come on the market to actually sell. Therefore, it's creating this demand issue. So that's one of the, the one of the things. The other thing is with, with baby boomers is technology in itself, medications, technology from the hospital side is allowing people to stay in their homes longer. So that's one component from the tenure of staying in their house longer. The other thing is, is builders, which I am, and builders themselves over the last 10 years have been running at a deficit, meaning that on average, there should be about, a, say, a million homes built per year. We've been running at about 700,000. So if you factor that in there, 300,000 less supply of units every year over the last decade creates a backlog of not being able to generate enough new construction to satisfy the demand. It's another reason why you're seeing this. Right. There are a re couple reasons why that's happening. One is there's a massive labor shortage in the construction field. There, last time I checked, there's 276,000 job openings, and every time I see that number, it increases in the construction field. We cannot find enough labor to build the homes. The other thing is, is builders in general have a little bit of a bad taste in their mouths from what happened from 2006 to 2010. So people are much less, they don't have quite the appetite that they did and or banks don't have the lending appetite that they did to generate that type of home, which is good, they shouldn't. So the lack of inventory has, is spurring the demand. And then the second component of this is the average cost per acre has increased about 50 grand over the last five years nationwide, meaning the cost to develop a piece of uh, one unit on a, on a, on a per dwelling unit has increased over 50 grand in the last five years, making land, permitting, expenses, carrying costs, all that stuff, $50,000 more expensive per house, which again, drives builders to say, no thanks to buying land, and it drives the price points higher, which is eliminating about 33% of the marketplace at any given time should be first time home buyers. We haven't necessarily seen that because there's not that amount of home buyers. So if I take the third bucket of this, which is also for the forecasting of real estate, home buy 33% of home buyers should be first time home buyers. You're seeing that being around 28% or so. And a lot of that, or sometimes less depending on the area, 25% has to do with the fact that people are renting longer than they ever have before. They don't want the responsibility of buying a home or owning a home and different things like yeah, that. So you're yeah, like that young people, they don't even want a house. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we factor in all of those pieces. That's what's happening in the marketplace. And that's why we're seeing a, there's more demand than supply right now. Wow. Boy, am I glad I asked that question. Uh, I've got to get a little plug in for, for myself here. You're going to love this. <laughs> I buy properties at tax defaulted auctions, okay? And you certainly understand all that, but I won't go into detail on that. But one of the things I tell people is I say, stay out of the risk business and uh, don't buy too many of those old houses you have to fix up because they always cost twice as much as you think. Or mm -hmm. I should say four times as much as you think. But the point is, I tell them, buy residential lots. People say, well, what would I ever want with a residential lot? Now, I'm, not ta I'm talking about in known subdivisions and where the utilities are already in, because you, you already just told me an acre is $50,000. It probably doesn't cost that much to put in the utilities. The point I'm going to make, these properties, nobody will bid on them at the auction. 25% of every auction that takes place is residential lots that people have walked away from. 
I don't think people should be walking away from those. And if they continue to do that, it's okay with me because I, I teach my clients to buy those. Resident, and they're buying them for 10 and 15 cents on the dollar, if you can imagine such a thing. Now, not good for you because you don't want onesie twosies. We buy them onesie twosies, but there's certainly a, a built-in market for every contractor around that town that, that wants to do something and, and not take a big risk because it's just one lot and they can, we won't get into the selling of it, but you got my point. Uh, it's one mm-hmm. of the things I tell people, buy those residential lots. And we just had a guy over in Michigan, bought 28 of them. And the, the subdivision was started three years ago. And the houses in the subdivision are 150 to 200,000. And he paid a low of $200 a lot to $800 Jeez. a lot. And they awesome. are in. Can you imagine such a thing? He's going to right. He'll retire on that one project. Absolutely. It's, it's awesome. Unbelievable. And I told, I said, how much are you going to ask? He said, 10,000. I said, never mind. Ask 30,000. And, exactly. you know, finance them. Ask 30,000. You'll get it. And now he's getting it. It's just uh, absolutely a but residential lot. Anyway, let's get back to you because you're really the subject for today. And we're talking about wealth building, everybody, if you did tune in late, and wealth creation. And here's a guy that not only creates it, but he creates it for a lot of other people with some 400 employees. That's uh, really, uh, you're creating a lot of wealth. Now, tell us about this. I want to go back to leadership a little bit. And I know that you have a link that we'll talk about later. You can talk about it now if you want. But I want to get into most of my people talk about making money. And I'm very fortunate to have you here today. And the audience is fortunate to have you because we're not just talking about making money. You're an expert at leadership and you're so expert at it that you've replaced yourself. You got yourself hired out of the business so you can look at it from the top. So give us some insight into that because you can't run 450 people by yourself and have a wife and three kids at home and run Ironman and uh, do your meditation. You, you have to be a clear thinker and you're doing something different than everybody else. I've had some great mentors in my life to help me along, which is, I got to give them credit. It, part of it is just changing the way you're thinking about building wealth. There's wealth through real estate, there's wealth through businesses, and both of them I'm, I'm pressing at all times, right? I take a lot of my cash flow from my businesses and dump it into real estate, essentially is what happens. But the, so early on, I just, I just realized that I wanted to have time more than anything. And when the people that matter the most matter more than anything else, your decisions become easy. And so for me, I just took money in the beginning and put it back into people. The problem is, let me pause. I did make some mistakes. I bought some material items when I was younger that I shouldn't have bought. And I realized that quicker than probably most people do. So I stopped increasing my lifestyle and I started taking that additional money that I had coming in there, investing it into people. And what I started finding out quickly was that it gives you two things. It gives you freedom, which is what people want in their business. And it also gives you additional income because now you're seeing a return on the people. However, if you hire the wrong people, it's a disaster. And so most people hire the wrong people or don't know how to lead people. And they don't end up, they never end up building a a wealth through their business because they haven't taken the time to actually study it. This is what I mean by this. In your field of taxing, you've done so much research and so much, you have so much knowledge that you can do this without even thinking about it. But, and that's why people need to take your course and and get your advice from these things because you're an expert in this. I just, when I first started my career, I said, look, I know that this is a, I want to be involved with people. I want time and I want money. I want both of them. And so I know that the only way that's going to happen is by having the best people. I need Tom Brady's around me at all times. So I just went and started allocating hundreds of thousands of dollars to investment into myself over the course of, and it's never ending of instead of reading books about how to manage business or things like that, I started reading books about how to hire because that's where the most important thing is. So I, now I teach courses called Career Visioning on how to hire. I'm going to Idaho next week to, to teach this course. And it's, it's, that became my focus was learning about myself, learning my shortfalls, learning my personality and my behavior. And then how do I hire people? Then once I learn how to hire people, how do I then lead them? What does the first 30, 60, 90 days look like in, my, in the business when they come in here? How do I hold people accountable? What does accountability mean? How do they win in my life? So I just made my energy went towards how do I lead and hire the best people in the world? And that's how it's allowed me to get to where I am today is because of the people that are around me. And so when you create a world large enough that people can be in your world succeeding at their highest level and that you're constantly focused on increasing your world, that's how you build generational wealth inside your companies. Oh, that's really, that's, that's insightful. Listen, you've got a lot of wisdom. Uh, I want to pull some more of it out of you if I can. Give us an I. No, you didn't rehearse this. You didn't have a chance because nobody, I didn't know I was going to ask it myself until you started talking. Um, give us some insight into the, 
some books that come to the top of your head. Hopefully you're in your office and they're over there on the bookshelf. <laughs> no. Uh, but if they're not, just give me some insight into books people should be, yep. if they want to learn about leadership. Leadership is, the average entrepreneur never even knows what the word is, let alone uh, think about doing it. They, entrepreneurs just do stuff. And exactly. Do yes. And then they come back and they get their butt kicked because, why did you do that? I, at the time, I thought it was great, but now it's a terrible idea and I got to get rid of it. But you know what I'm saying. That's exactly right. Yeah. I read about a book or two a week put in the perspective for people a book a uh, week. Uh, sometimes two sometimes three depending on the size of the book but a couple of really good books to start with number one is there's a book called the one thing by gary keller it's an awesome book it teaches you about the power of one thing it disturbs a lot of myths about multitasking and different things okay. so i would definitely start with that the one thing he also meets people where they are and infuses a little bit of what money is about that in that book which is great if you want to get more on a little bit of your on the spiritual side of journey and remember i think there is a a relationship between business and spirituality and i hate that word because people get lost in that i just mean that you're doing it for you're helping people like you said earlier there's a really good book called michael singer wrote called the surrender the, the, the surrender experiment which is one and then the untethered soul those are two books that he wrote good to great by jim collins is an awesome book as well too from a leadership perspective but any book that has to do with hiring and leading people is just it's such a fundamental that's if you want, the definition of building a business is, in my world is that you can leave your business without doing it. Most entrepreneurs say they have a business, but really what they are is just sole entrepreneurs with a bunch of W-2 employees around them. And if they ever left, their business would go downhill. So they right. become the nucleus of the organization. I never wanted to be the nucleus. I wanted to make it about other people and systems and models being the nucleus so that I wasn't having to be in my organization at all times and it would still continue to grow. So you have to learn about hiring. So I would start with those books right there. I do have a good reads account that are, that's linked to adamhergenrother.com if you want to go see all the books that I continue to read and I always post them. I keep that updated. Through oh, right please. Uh, give us that address again. People should do that. They should. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big reader myself, so I get awesome. it. But people in my office actually look at me. What are you going to do with that book? What are you going to do? And some of these are, are, when you get a six or 800 page book, you know, it's, it's a love of life then because you can just sit there for hours and say, oh my goodness. And you're filling your brain up as other people fill their bellies with steak and beer. They, what's wrong with that? That's a great thing. I love that. What was the address where they could do? Yeah, you, they it's the same with adamhergenrother.com, and you can click on there, and you'll see the Goodreads account. That everything's hooked to that, so you can see oh, it. That's there. Nice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Boy, you're really sharing a lot with us today. I appreciate that. Okay, so your success, you like to t say as everybody else, but you're a clear thinker. You're a very clear thinker. Otherwise, you couldn't think of, of these things and, and uh, do that. So tell me about, just give me a, a couple of minutes on it, because I know it's the biggest weakness of all the entrepreneurs I've met. And that's this tie the leadership to the hiring once again for us in maybe a, a different way than you did the first time. I just want to reiterate that because it's so powerful for, look, I can teach people how to make money and you can do that too. But where they get bogged down is they don't realize that they need to train an assistant and then they need to train another person to help them out and they need to train themselves basically out of that business. You call it hire yourself out, but I, I just use different words. I, I think we probably have both have the same intent. Could you talk some more about that? Do you mind? Yeah, for one is you got to make the conscious decision that you're going to go fail forward, which means you're going to make mistakes, but knowing that they're going to be part of your failure and your journey and your process, it's just making a dedication mentally that you're going to you're gonna continue to go in there and bring the right people on. Mistake people make is who they hire and different things. So actually, I wrote a book with Howie, my chief of staff. It's called The Founder in the Force Multiplier. The Founder in the Force Multiplier. It's how entrepreneurs and executive assistants achieve more together. And the, the ethos of the book is that how do you create a strategic partnership with your right-hand person? And what you're saying, I know you have a great EA too. I think one of the things people are seeing is that the, the EA role and the chief of staff role is becoming a very well-known leadership role amongst it's particularly in the C-suite now, and it's a big conversation. And the reason why it is because an amazing executive assistant or chief of staff, whatever you want to call them now, that force multiplier allows you to go and, and work in your strength zone. So it doesn't mean you're working on different things. You're just working on the same thing, but each of you works on different parts of it. So you force multiply the opportunity within there. And that EA role, if you dig deep into businesses, that first hire, that behind the scenes hire is such, a, such an important position to set the table for your world. And I went through five, six different EAs in the very beginning until I found one and then Howie and I have grown. So that's why we wrote, 
it was funny because my blog, it's fun to test things out, right? So last year, the reason why we decided to write this, and Hallie has a voice in this book too, which is important because I wanted people to hear it from her side, is because I wrote the first, art, the first blog I wrote about just the EA relationship with your founder, it went through the roof. Like we had more reads on that. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Maybe it's timing or, or article. About 60 days later, I wrote another one and the same thing happened. And then another 60 days later, the same thing happened. So we wrote the book called The Founder and Force Multiplier. And it's in Amazon and Microsoft. It's gone through all of those different companies now, which is cool. And it gives you models, systems, tools that you need to create that and who it is that you are and who you're looking for to bring in the right person into your world and creating expectations and accountabilities. So it's really the first step into how, what it is you have to hire. And regardless of whether or not I wrote a book or not, that is your first hire. That is your first key position to add leverage to your life. Once you nail that position, you then allow your EA to start hiring other people underneath their world for jobs that they don't like, then they can focus on doing more important jobs. So everybody starts doing less, but accomplishing more because they're focused on their key initiatives that they need to drive the organization. Once you start getting an understanding of that, you start seeing clearly how much people matter. I say that like in the terms because Everyone says that. Remember, people only know the highest level of talent based on the highest level of talent that they've ever led. Not that they've been around ever led. And so most people, they could be a C in somebody's world, but an A in somebody else's. Or they could be a D in somebody's world and an A in somebody else's. So right, right. you just got to keep focused on that journey and just understand that you've got to make the commitment to being engaged with your employees and hiring the right people and then never, look, if you bought a lawnmower and it didn't work, you would take it back. We get stuck with people in our lives, which is, this is actually why I think most businesses stay where they are because they, they settle because people, this is where Jim Collins wrote Good to Great. I recommended that book earlier is because people, a lot of times people in organizations have B minus players. It doesn't mean they're not profitable. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means they're not great. And the difference between that and great is what separates companies. Exactly. You're such a natural teacher. You're dedicated yourself to serving people in the true sense of the word. Your enthusiasm when you talk comes right through into my ears. It's absolutely stunning. You're really uh, an enthusiastic person. I love this uh, interview. It's really exciting. Look, we're going to run out of time. I want you to give a couple of addresses, and I want you to definitely tell people where to go to listen to your, give them a link and whatever to your podcast and whatever, so they can uh, learn more about this leadership. I think that's important. And after you do that, can you just give us some insight into where you're investing your money today? So we might as well get all your inside secrets right now. Yeah. AdamHerganRother.com. Again, go to AdamHerganRother.com. We'll link you to everything. Herg Life blog. I don't have a podcast, but I have a blog that I write every week. Definitely subscribe to that. And then if you're interested in the founder and the force multiplier, you can go to that website, the founder and the force multiplier, or go, it's on Amazon. So you can just go type it in Amazon. You can buy it through there too as well. But in terms of where I'm investing my money, it always is a couple of things. Number one, I'm always investing back into myself. Number one. And number two, I'm always investing into people. I think people have the, can give you the greatest return more than anything else if it's the right person. If it's the wrong person, it becomes a disaster. And then third, as I shared earlier, the remaining parts of my money goes in the real estate. Wow, good for you. Wow, this is wonderful. Listen, I couldn't thank you enough. This is uh, not only an education for me, but for all my people, that it's going to be wonderful. This is going to be replayed and replayed again and again. I, I know it is. Uh, Hey, this is Linda. Don't forget, you can listen to more episodes at tedthomaspodcast.com. You can also listen to Imagine Wealth Without Risk on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Spotify.